Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by thanking the trustees of the National Gallery, and in particular Mr. Walker, for saying kind things about me and for giving me much more than my due. Uh, it's infinitely more agreeable to receive more than one's due than one's due. <laughs> that I can assure you of. And indeed, in being asked to deliver these lectures, I receive more than my due. For, so far as I can gather, these lectures are primarily intended for genuine experts on the arts, art historians and experts on aesthetics, amongst whom I cannot possibly count myself. It is therefore a particular generosity on their part to have invited me. My only valid excuse for talking about the subject is that the romantic movement naturally is relevant to the arts. It, the arts, even though I know not very much about them, cannot be altogether kept out. And I promise not to keep them out beyond measure. The second reason why I can claim some qualification for talking about this subject is that I propose to deal with political and social and moral life as well. And it is true, I think, to say of the romantic movement that it is not only a movement in which the arts are concerned, not only an artistic movement, but perhaps the first moment, certainly in the history of the West, when the arts dominated other aspects of life, when there was a kind of tyranny of art over life, which in some sense is the essence of the romantic movement. At least I propose to try and demonstrate that this is so. Certainly, the interest in Romanticism is not simply a historical, a historical one. A great many movements of the present day, nationalism, existentialism, admiration for great men, admiration for impersonal institutions, democracy, totalitarianism, all these things are profoundly affected by the rise of Romanticism, which enters them all. And that is why it is a subject not altogether irrelevant, even to our own day. Perhaps you would expect me to begin, or at least to attempt to begin, with some kind of definition of Romanticism, or at least some generalization in order to say what it is that I mean by it. I don't propose to walk into that particular trap. <laughs> the eminent and wise Professor Northrop Fry points out that whenever anyone embarks on a generalization on the subject of Romanticism, even something so innocuous, for example, as to say that a new attitude sprang up among English poets towards nature, let us say, Wordsworth and Coleridge, as against, say, Dryden and Pope. Somebody will always be found who will produce countervailing evidence from the writings of Homer, Kalidaza, pre-Muslim Arabian epics, <laughs> medieval Spanish verse, and finally, Dryden and Pope themselves. <laughs> and for this reason, I don't propose to generalize. I propose, if I may, simply to convey in some other way what it is that I think Romanticism to be. Indeed, the literature on Romanticism is larger than Romanticism itself. And the literature defining what it is that the literature on Romanticism is concerned with is quite large in its turn. It's a kind of inverted pyramid. It's a dangerous and, and confused subject in which many have lost, I won't say their senses, but at any rate their sense of direction. It's like, one of the, it's that, like the dark cave described, I think, by Virgil, where all the footsteps leave it in one direction, the cave of Polyphemus. Those who enter it are never seen to emerge again. It is therefore with some trepidation that I embark upon the subject. <laughs> Let me begin by saying that I think that the importance of Romanticism is that it is the largest recent movement which transformed the lives and the thought of the Western world. It seems to me to be the greatest single shift in the consciousness of the West that has occurred. And all the other shifts which have occurred in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries appear to me comparably less important and at any rate deeply influenced by it. The history of not only thought, but consciousness, opinion, action to morals, politics, aesthetics, is to a large degree a history of dominant models. Let me try and explain what I mean. Always, whenever you look at any particular civilization, I think you will find that its most characteristic writings are dominated by a particular pattern of life, which those who engage in these writings or paint these paintings or produce these particular music, works of uh, pieces of music, in some sense are dominated by. And in order to identify a civilization, in order to explain what kind of civilization it is, in order to understand the world in which men of this sort thought and felt and acted, it is, I think, of importance to try, so far as possible, to isolate the dominant pattern which that culture obeys. Let me try to explain this by examples. For instance, if you read Greek philosophy or Greek literature of the classical age. You will find, for example, in the case of 
say the philosophy of Plato, that he is dominated by a geometrical or mathematical model. It is clear that his thought operates on lines which are in some way conditioned by the thought that there are certain axiomatic truths, adamantine, unbreakable, from which it is possible by severe logic to deduce certain absolutely infallible conclusions. That it is possible to attain to this kind of absolute wisdom by a special method which he recommends. That there, are, there is such a thing as absolute knowledge to be obtained in the world. And if only we can attain to this absolute knowledge, of which geometry and mathematics in general is the nearest example, the most perfect paradigm, if only we can do that, we can organize our lives in terms of this knowledge, in terms of these truths, once and for all, in a static manner, needing no further change, and then all suffering, all doubt, all ignorance, all forms of human vice and folly can be expected to disappear from the earth. And this notion that there is somewhere a perfect vision, and that it needs only a certain kind of severe discipline or a certain kind of method to attain to this truth, which is analogous at any rate to the uh, cold and isolated truths of mathematics. This vision then affects a great many other thinkers in the post-Platonic age. Certainly the Renaissance, which had similar ideas. Certainly thinkers like Spinoza, thinkers in the 18th century, thinkers in the 19th century too, who believed it possible to attain to some kind of if not absolute, at any rate nearly absolute knowledge, and in terms of this, to tidy the world up, to create some kind of rational order in which tragedy, vice, and stupidity, which have caused so much destruction in the past, can at last be avoided by the use of carefully acquired information and the application to it of universally intelligible reason, something of that kind. Now, this is one way of, one kind of model. So I simply offer it as an example. These models invariably begin by liberating people from error, from confusion, from some kind of unintelligible world which they seek to explain to themselves by means of a model. But they almost invariably end by enslaving those very same men, by failing to explain the whole of experience, by beginning as liberators and ending as in, in some sort of despotism. Take, for example, a parallel culture, that of the Bible, that of the Jews at a comparable period. You will find a totally different model dominating, a totally different set of ideas which would have been unintelligible to the Greeks. The notion, certainly, from which both Judaism and Christianity to a large degree sprang, is the notion of family life, the relations of father and son, perhaps the relations of members of a tribe to one another. Such fundamental relationships in terms of which nature and life are explained as the love of children for their father, the brotherhood of man, forgiveness, atonement, commands issued by a superior to an inferior, the sense of duty, transgression, sin and therefore the need to atone for it. This whole complex of qualities, in terms of which the whole of the universe is explained by those who created the Bible and by those who are to a large extent influenced by it, is something which would have been totally unintelligible to the Greeks. Let me read you a perfectly familiar psalm and you will see um, what it is that I mean. For instance, when the psalm, psalmist says that in the presence of the Lord, the sea saw and fled, Jordan was driven back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills skipped like young lambs. The earth trembles, is ordered to tremble in the presence of the Lord. This would have been totally unintelligible to Plato or to Aristotle. Because the whole notion of it, so to speak, the whole notion of a world which is, in some sense, reacts personally to the orders of the Lord, that all relationships, both animate and inanimate, must in some way be interpreted in terms of the relations of human beings, or at any rate, the relations of personalities, in one case divine, in the other case human, is very remote from the Greek conception of what a god was and what his relations were to mankind. Hence the absence among the Greeks of the notion of obligation. Hence the absence among the Greeks of the notion of duty, which it is so difficult for people who read the Greeks through the spectacles, part affected by the Druze to grasp. Let me try and convey to you how strange different models can be because this is important in simply tracing the history of these transformations of consciousness. In, what I wish to convey is that considerable revolutions have occurred in the general um, outlook of mankind which it's sometimes difficult to retrace because we swallow them as if they were familiar. Vico was perhaps the Italian thinker who flourished at the beginning of the 18th century if a man who was totally poor and neglected may be said to have flourished. Vico is the man who, I suppose, drew our attention to the strangeness of these ancient cultures. He points out, for example, that in the familiar line, omnia plena jovis, everything is full of Jove, which is a perfectly familiar uh, Latin half-line, 
something to us not wholly unintelligible is said. On the one hand, Jupiter, or Jove, is a large bearded divinity who hurls thunder, lightning. On the other hand, in some sense, the entire, um, e everything, Omnia, is said to be full of this bearded being, which is not on the face of it intelligible. And he then argues with great imagination and with great cogency that somehow the view of these ancient peoples remote from us must have been very different from ours for them to have been able to conceive of their divinity both as a bearded giant commanding the gods and men and on the other hand as something of which the whole heavens could be full. Let me give you a more familiar example. When Aristotle, for example, in the Nicomachean Ethics discusses the subject of friendship, he says rather to us in a somewhat surprising manner that there are various kinds of friends. For example, there is friendship which consists in passionate infatuation by one human being or an, uh, with another. And there is also a friendship which consists in business relationship, in trading, in buying and selling. The fact that for Aristotle there is nothing strange in saying there are two kinds of friends. There are people whose whole lives are, give, are given or at any rate whose emotions are passionately engaged in love. And on the other hand, of course, there are people who sell shoes to one another. And these are species of the same genus. Is something which as a result perhaps of Christianity or of the Romantic movement or whatever it may be, we find it rather difficult to acclimatize ourselves to. I merely give you these examples in order to convey to you that these ancient cultures are stranger than we think and that larger transformations have occurred in the history of human consciousness than the ordinary uncritical reading of the classics would seem to convey. There are a great many other examples which are, with which I shall not trouble you. Uh, there is of course, I mean, the world can be conceived organically like a tree in, in which every part lives for every other part and through every other part, and again, mechanistically as a result of, say, si some scientific model in which the parts are external to one another and in which, for example, say, the state or any other human institution is regarded as a gadget for the purpose of promoting happiness or preventing people from uh, doing each other in. These are very different conceptions of life, and they do belong to different climates of opinion and are influenced by different considerations. What as a rule happens is that some subject gains the ascendancy, say physics or say chemistry, and as a result of the enormous hold which it has upon the imagination of its generation, it is applied in other spheres as well. This happened to sociology in the 19th century, it happened to psychology in our own. Now, my thesis is that the Romantic movement, in some sense, was just such a gigantic and radical transformation, after which nothing was ever the same. And this is the subject to which I really wish to address myself. Where did the Romantic movement take its rise? Before I even say what it is, certainly not in England, although technically, no doubt it did. That is what all the historians of thought will tell you. At any rate, that is not where it occurred in its most dramatic form. The question arises when I speak of Romanticism, do I mean something which happens historically, as I appear to be saying, or is it perhaps a permanent frame of mind? which isn't exclusive, isn't monopolized by any particular age. Two of my eminent predecessors, Sir Herbert Reed and Sir Kenneth Clark, both Mellon lecturers, have taken up the position that Romanticism is a permanent state of mind which might be found anywhere. Um, Sir Kenneth Clark finds it, I think, in some lines of Hadrian's. Sir Herbert Reed quotes a very great many examples. The Baron Seyer, who has written extensively on this subject, quotes Plato and Plotinus, and the Greek novelist Heliodorus and a great many other persons who, who, in his opinion, were romantic writers. I don't wish to enter upon this issue, it may be so, but the subject with which I wish to deal is confined in time. I don't wish to deal with a permanent human attitude, but with a particular transformation which historically occurred and affects us. And therefore I propose to confine my attention to what occurred in the second third of the 18th century. It occurred not in England, it occurred not in France, it occurred for the most part in Germany. The common view of history and historical change is that we begin with the French 18e, an elegant century in which everything begins by being calm and smooth, rules are obeyed both in life and in art, uh, there is a general advance of reason, rationality is progressing, the church is retreating, unreason is yielding to the great attacks upon it of the French philosophe, there is peace, there is calm, there is elegant building. There is a belief in universal reason applying both to human affairs and to artistic practice, to morals, to politics, to philosophy. And then there is a sudden, apparently unaccountable invasion. Suddenly there is a violent eruption of emotion, enthusiasm, 
People become interested in Gothic buildings, in introspection. People suddenly become neurotic and melancholy. They begin to admire the unaccountable flights of spontaneous genius. Uh, there is a general retreat from this symmetrical, elegant, glassy state of affairs. At the same time, other changes occur too. A, French, a rev great revolution breaks out. There is discontent. A revolution breaks out. The king has his head cut off. The terror begins. It's not quite clear what these two revolutions have to do with each other. As we read history on the whole, there is a general sense that something catastrophic occurred towards the end of the 18th century. At first, things appear to go comparatively smoothly, then there was a sudden breakthrough. Some welcome it, some denounce it. Those who denounce it suppose that this age to have been an elegant and peaceful age. Those who didn't know it didn't know the true douceur de la vie, as Talleyrand said. Others, on the other hand, say it was an artificial and hypocritical age, um, and the revolution ushered in um, a reign of greater justice, greater humanity, greater freedom, greater understanding of man for man. Well, that's as may be. The question is, what is the relation of the so-called romantic revolution, the sudden breakthrough, as it were, in what might be called um, the, the realms of art or of morals, of this new and, and turbulent attitude, and the revolution which is normally known as the French Revolution? Were the people who danced upon the ruins of the Bastille, were the people who cut off the head of Louis XVI, were these the same persons as those who were affected by the sudden cult of genius, or the sudden breakthrough of emotionalism, of which we are told, or the sudden disturbance and turbulence which suddenly flood the Western world? Apparently not. Certainly the principles in the, in the name of which the French Revolution was fought were principles of universal reason, of order, of justice, not at all connected with the sense of uniqueness, the profound emotional introspection, the sense of the differences of things, the dissimilarities rather than the similarities with which the Romantic movement is usually associated. At this point, someone will say, what about Rousseau? Well, Rousseau, of course, in a sense, is quite correctly attributed um, to the Romantic movement as one of its fathers. But the Rousseau who is responsible for the ideas of Robespierre, the Rousseau who is responsible for the ideas of the French Jacobins, is not the Rousseau, it seems to me, who has obvious connection with Romanticism. That Rousseau is the Rousseau who wrote the social contract, which is a classical treatise, a typically classical treatise, which speaks of the return of man to original, those primary principles which all men have in common, the reign of universal reason which unites men as opposed to emotions which divide him, the reign of universal justice and universal peace as against the conflicts and the turbulence and the disturbances which on the whole tear human hearts from their minds and divide men against themselves. So that it's difficult to see what is the relation of this great romantic upheaval to the political revolution. And then there is the industrial revolution too which cannot be regarded as irrelevant. After all, ideas don't breed ideas. Some social and economic factors are surely responsible for great upheavals in the human consciousness. So we have on our hands a problem. There is the Industrial Revolution, there is the great French political revolution under classical auspices, and there is the Romantic Revolution. Even if we look at the arts, if we look at the, the great art of the French Revolution, for example, the great revolutionary paintings of David, it's difficult to connect him specifically with the Romantic Revolution. The paintings of David, have a kind of austere eloquence, the austere Jacobin eloquence of a return to Spartans, a return to Romans, something, a protest against the frivolity and the superficiality of life, which is connected with the preachings of such men as Machiavelli or Savonarola or Mabli, people who denounced the frivolity of their age in the name of eternal ideals of a universal kind, whereas the Romantic movement, well, told by all its historians, was a passionate protest against universality of any kind. And therefore, there is, prima facie at any rate, a problem to understand what happened. In order to give you some sense of what it is that I regard as being this great breakthrough, why I think that in those years, say 1760 to 1830, something transforming occurred. There was a great break in the European consciousness. In order to give you at any rate, some preliminary evidence of why I think there is even a case for this, let me give you an example of what I mean. Supposing you were traveling about Western Europe, say, in the 1820s, and supposing in France you spoke to the avant-garde young men who were friends of Victor Hugo, Hugo Latre, and supposing you went to Germany and spoke there to the people who had uh, once been visited by Madame de Stael, who had interpreted the German soul to the French. Supposing you had met 
the Schlegel brothers, who were great theorists of Romanticism, or, let us say, the people, one or two of the friends of Goethe in Weimar, the fabulist and poet Tieck, other persons connected with the Romantic movement, and their followers in the universities, students, young men, painters, sculptors, who were deeply influenced by the work of these poets and these dramatists and these critics. And supposing in England you had spoken to someone who'd been influenced, say, by Coleridge, and above all by Byron, anyone influenced by Byron, whether in England or France or Italy, or beyond the Rhine or beyond the Elbe, supposing you had spoken to these persons, you would have found that their ideal of life was approximately of this kind, that the values to which they attach the highest importance are such values as dedication to an ideal, integrity, sincerity, readiness to sacrifice one's life to some inner light, to some ideal for which it is worth sacrificing all that one is, for which it is worth both living and dying. You would have found that they were not primarily interested, say, in knowledge, say, in the advances of science, not interested in political power, not interested in happiness, not interested above all in adjustment to life, in finding your place in society, in living at peace with your government, in, even in loyalty perhaps to your king or to your republic. You would have found that common sense, moderation, was very far from their thoughts. You would have found that what they believed in was the necessity of fighting for whatever you believed in to the last breath in your body. And you would have found that there were persons who on the whole believed in the value of martyrdom as such, no matter what the martyrdom was martyrdom for. You would have found that they believed that minorities were in some way more holy than majorities, that failure was in a certain sense nobler than success, which had certainly something shoddy and something vulgar about it. You would have found the very notion of idealism, which is not in its philosophical sense, but in the ordinary sense in which we use it. Idealism, that is to say, the state of mind of a man who is prepared to sacrifice a great deal for principle or for some conviction, who is not prepared to sell out, who is prepared to go to the stake for something which he believes because he believes in it. This attitude was relatively new. And what people admired was wholeheartedness, sincerity, purity of soul, ability and readiness to dedicate yourself for your ideal, no matter what it was. No matter what it was. That is the important phrase which I wish to use. Supposing in the 16th century, say, you had a conversation with somebody engaged in the great religious wars which tore Europe apart at that period. And supposing you said to, let us say, a Catholic of that period, engaged in hostilities, supposing you said, of course these Protestants believe what is false. Of course to believe what they believe is to court perdition. Of course they are dangerous to the salvation of human souls than which there is nothing more important. But they are so sincere, they die so readily for their cause, their integrity is so splendid, one must yield a certain meed of admiration for the moral dignity and sublimity of people who are prepared to do that. Such a sentiment would have been unintelligible. Anyone who really knew, supposed themselves to know the truth, say a Catholic who believed in the truths preached to him by the church, would have known that persons able to put the whole of themselves into the theory and practice of falsehood were simply dangerous persons, and the more sincere they were, the more dangerous, the more mad in a sense. No Christian knight would have supposed when he fought against a Muslim that he was uh, expected to admire the purity and the sincerity with which the Paynim believed in their absurd doctrines. No doubt, if you were a decent person and you killed a brave enemy, you, could, you didn't, weren't obliged to spit upon his corpse. You um, took the line that it was a pity that so much courage, which was a universally admired quality, so much courage, so much ability, so much devotion should have gone to a cause so palpably absurd or dangerous. But certainly you wouldn't have said it matters little what these people believe. What matters is the state of mind in which they believe it. What matters is that they didn't sell out, that they were men of integrity. These are people I can respect. If they had come over to our side simply in order to save themselves, that would have been a very self-seeking, a very prudent, a very contemptible form of action. This is the state of mind in which people would say, if I believe one thing and you believe another, then it is important that we should fight each other. Perhaps it is good that you should kill me or that I should kill you. Perhaps in a duel it is best that we should kill each other. But the worst of all possible things is compromise. Because that means we have both betrayed the ideal which is within us.
Now, martyrdom was always, of course, admired, but martyrdom for the truth. Christians admired martyrs because they were witnesses to the truth. If they were witnesses to falsehood, there was nothing admirable about them. Perhaps something to be pitied. Certainly nothing to be admired. By the time you get to the 1820s, the period in which I speak, you certainly get a frame of mind in which the state of mind, the motive is more important than the consequence. The intention is more important than the effect. The purity of heart, integrity, devotion, dedication, all these things which we ourselves admire without much difficulty, which is entered so speak, into the very texture of our normal moral attitudes, became more or less commonplace. First, among minorities, gradually they spread outwards. Let me give you an example of what I mean by a shift. Take, for example, Voltaire's play uh, on Muhammad. Well, Voltaire was not particularly interested in Muhammad, and the play on Muhammad was really intended, no doubt, as an attack upon the church. Nevertheless, Muhammad in, in Voltaire's play emerges as a superstitious, cruel, and fanatical monster who crushes um, all efforts at freedom, at justice, at reason, and is therefore to be denounced as an enemy of all that Voltaire held uh, most important, toleration, justice, truth, civilization. And then consider what, for example, not so very much later, Carlyle has to say on the subject, who in a sense is a highly characteristic, if somewhat exaggerated, representative of the Romantic movement. He is described by Carlyle in the course of a book called Heroes and Hero Worship, in the course of which a great many heroes are enumerated and um, analyzed. He, Muhammad is described as a fiery mass of life cast up from the great bosom of nature herself. He's a man of blazing sincerity and power, and therefore to be admired. And what he is compared to, what is not liked, is the 18th century, which is withered and useless. The, the 18th century, which to Carlyle, as, as he calls it, is a warped and second-rate century. The point about Muhammad is that Carlyle is not the least interested in the truths of the Quran. He doesn't begin to suppose that the Quran does contain anything, which he, Carlyle, could be expected to believe. But what he admires Muhammad for is that he's an elemental force, that he lives an intense life, that he had a great many followers with him, that something elemental occurred, that in some way a tremendous phenomenon occurred, that there was a great movement, a great and moving episode in the life of mankind, which Muhammad in some way instantiates, and the importance of what Muhammad is his character and not his beliefs. The, the question of whether what Muhammad believed was true or false would have appeared to Carlyle perfectly irrelevant. He says, in the course of the same essays, Dante's sublime Catholicism had to be torn asunder by Luther. Shakespeare's noble feudalism has to end in the French Revolution. Why, does, why do they have to do this? Because it doesn't matter whether Dante's noble Catholicism or sublime Catholicism is or is not true. The point is, it's a great movement, it has lasted its time, and now something equally powerful, equally earnest, equally sincere, equally deep, equally earth-shaking must take its place. The importance of the French Revolution is that it made a great dent upon the consciousness of mankind, that the men who made the French Revolution were deeply in earnest, and not simply um, smiling hypocrites, as he thought Voltaire to be. Now, this is an attitude which I think is, I won't say brand new, because it's too dangerous to say that, but at any rate, sufficiently new to be worthy of attention. And whatever it was that caused it occurred, it seems to me, somewhere between the year 1760 and 1830. And it began in Germany then and grew apace. The important thing now is to consider what kinds of effects this kind of development had. Again, I don't wish to enumerate this because I propose to deal with the details of it in forthcoming lectures. But take another example of the sort of things I mean. The attitude, for example, towards tragedy. Broadly speaking, previous generations assumed that tragedy was always due to some kind of error. Someone got something wrong, so to speak. Someone made a mistake. Either it was moral error or it was intellectual error. It might have been avoidable or it might have been unavoidable. Greek tragedy was error which the gods sent upon you, which no man subject to them could perhaps have avoided. But in principle, if these men had been omniscient, they would not have committed those grave errors which they did commit, and therefore not have brought misfortunes upon themselves. If Oedipus had known that Laios was his father, he wouldn't have murdered him. This is true even of the tragedies of Shakespeare to a certain degree. If Othello had known that Desdemona was innocent, none of the denouement of that particular tragedy could have occurred. And therefore, the tragedy is founded upon, if you like, the inevitable or perhaps avoidable lack of something in men, knowledge, skill, ability to live, moral courage, ability to do the right thing when you see it, or whatever it may be. Better men, morally stronger, 
intellectually more adept, above all omniscient persons who perhaps also had enough power, could always avoid that which, in fact, is the substance of tragedy. This is not so for the early 19th century. Even for the late 18th, if you read Schiller's tragedy of the robbers, to which I shall have to return again, you will find that Karl Moore, the hero of that, the hero villain of that, is a man who avenges himself upon a detestable society by becoming a brigand and committing a number of atrocious murders. He is punished for it in the end. But if you ask who is to blame, is it the society in which, he's, with which he comes, are its values totally corrupt, or are his values totally insane, which of the two sides is right? Certainly there is no answer to be obtained in that tragedy, and the very question would have appeared to Schiller shallow and, in some sense, blind. Here there is a collision, perhaps an unavoidable collision, between sets of values which are literally incompatible. Previous generations supposed that all good things could in some way be reconciled. This is true no longer. If you read Büchner's tragedy, The Death of Danton, in which Robespierre finally causes the death of Danton and Desmoulins in the course of the revolution. And you ask, was Robespierre wrong to do this? No. The tragedy is such that Danton, although he was a sincere revolutionary who committed certain errors, didn't deserve to die, and Robespierre was perfectly right in putting him to death. In some sense, you have a collision here of what Hegel afterwards called good with good. It isn't due to error. It's due to some kind of collision or conflict of an unavoidable kind of loose elements wandering about the earth in some way of values which couldn't, in some sense, be reconciled. And what matters is that people should dedicate themselves to these values with all that is in them. If they do that, they are suitable heroes for tragedy. If they do not do that, then they are Philistines, then they are members of the bourgeoisie, then they are no good and not worth writing about. The figure who, in some sense, dominates that particular century as an image is the thousandth figure of Beethoven in his garret. Beethoven is a man who does what is in him. He is poor, he is ignorant, he is boorish. His manners are bad, he knows little, and he's perhaps not a very interesting figure outside the inspiration which drives him forward. But his, the point about him is that he has not sold out. He sits in his garret and he creates. He creates in accordance with the light which is within him. And that is all that a man should do. This is what makes a man a hero. Even if Beethoven were not a genius, even if like the hero of Balzac's Le chef dœuvre inconnu, the unknown masterpiece, he is mad and covers his canvas with paints, so that in the end there is nothing intelligible at all, just a fearful confusion of unintelligible and irrational paint. Even then, this figure is worthy of more than pity. He is in some sense a man who has dedicated himself to an ideal, who has thrown away the world, who is in some sense represents the most heroic, the most self-sacrificing, the most splendid qualities which a human being can have. When Gautier, in the famous introduction to Mademoiselle de Maupin, in, I think, 1835, defending the notion of art for art's sake, says, fools, cretins, this is addressed to the critics in general, the public too, fools, cretins, you cannot make soup out of a book. A novel is not a pair of boots. A sonnet is not a syringe. A drama is not a railway. A thousand times no, no, a thousand times no. Gautier's point is that the old defense of art, quite apart from the particular school of um, social utility, which he's attacking, Saint-Simon and the utilitarians, who are in fact the object of attack, and the socialists. Apart from these, the notion that the purpose of art, for example, is to give pleasure to a large number of persons, or even to a small number of carefully trained conoscenti, is not true. The purpose of art is to produce beauty, and if only the artist alone perceives that his object is beautiful, that is a sufficient end to life. Clearly, something occurred to have shifted consciousness to this degree, to have shifted it away from the notion that there are universal truths, universal canons of art, that in some sense all human activities were meant to terminate in getting things right, and the criteria of getting things right were in some way public, in some way demonstrable. All intelligent men, by applying their intellects, could discover them, has shifted from that to a wholly different attitude towards life and towards action. Something clearly occurred. We ask what? We are told that, the, well, again, that there was a great turn towards emotionalism, that there was a sudden interest in the primitive and the remote, the remote in time and remote in place, that there was an outbreak of craving for the infinite. Something is said about emotion recollected in tranquility. Something is said, but it's not clear what this has to do with any of the things which I've just mentioned, with Scott's novels, Schubert's songs, Delacroix, the rise of state worship, and German defense or German propaganda in favor of economic self-sufficiency.
Also, something to do with superhuman quantities, admiration of wild genius, outlaws, heroes, aestheticism, self-destruction. What have all these things in common? If we try and discover a somewhat startling prospect greets our view, let me offer you some definitions of romanticism which I have attempted to cull from the writings of some of the most eminent persons who have written on the subject. And you will see that the subject is by no means easy. Stendhal says, the romantic is the modern and the interesting. Classicism is the old and the dull. <laughs> it isn't quite perhaps as simple as it sounds. What he means is that romanticism means understanding the, the forces of, which move in your own life as opposed to some escape towards something which is obsolete. However, the, what he actually says in the book in, on Racine and Shakespeare is uh, that which I've just enunciated, namely the modern and the interesting, whereas classicism is the old and the dull. But Goethe says, romanticism is disease. It is the weak, the sickly, the battle cry of a school of wild poets and Catholic reactionaries, whereas classicism is strong, fresh, gay sound, like Homer in the Song of the Nibelungs. And Nietzsche says, it is not a disease, but a therapy, a cure for a disease. Sismondi, who was a Swiss critic of considerable imagination, though not perhaps altogether friendly to romanticism, in spite of being a friend of Madame de Stael, Sismondi says that romanticism is a union of love, religion, and chivalry. <laughs> but Gentz, who was Metternich's chief agent at this time, and a precise contemporary of Sismondi, as Goethe was indeed of Stendhal to some extent, Gentz says that it is one of the heads of the three-headed hydra, the other two heads being reform and revolution. It's in fact a left-wing menace, a menace to religion, to tradition, and to the past, which must be stamped out. And the young French romantics, Le Jeune France, echo this by saying, le romantisme, c'est la révolution. Revolution against what? Apparently against everything. Heine says romanticism is the passion flower sprung from the blood of Christ. A reawakening of the poetry of the Middle Ages, the sleepwalking Middle Ages, dreaming spires that look at you with deep, dolorous eyes of grinning spectres. And Marxists, I think, would add that it was indeed an escape from the horrors of the Industrial Revolution. And Ruskin, I think, would agree, saying it is a contrast of the beautiful past with the frightful and the monotonous present which is a modification of Heine's view, but not all that different from it. But Monsieur Taine says, Romanticism is a bourgeois revolt against the aristocracy after 1789. Romanticism is the expression of the energy and force of the new arrivists. The exact opposite. It's, 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 it's the expression of the pushing, vigorous powers of the new bourgeoisie against the old, decent, conservative values of society and history. It's expression not of weakness, nor of despair, but of brutal optimism. Friedrich Schlegel, who I suppose is the greatest harbinger, the greatest herald of Romanticism that ever lived, the greatest prophet of it, says, there is in man a terrible, unsatisfied desire to soar into infinity, a feverish longing to break through the narrow bonds of individuality. And you will find passages not altogether like this in Kelridge and indeed in Shelley too. But Professor Brunetier, towards the end of the century, says, that it is literary egotism. It is stressing of individuality at the expense of a larger world. It is the opposite of self-transcendence. It is sheer self-assertion. And the Baron Seyer adds, yes, and egomania and primitivism. And Professor Babbitt of Harvard University echoes this. <laughs> Schlegel, Friedrich Schlegel's brother, August Wilhelm Schlegel, and Madame de Stahl both agreed that romanticism comes from the Romance nations, or at least the Romance languages, that it really comes from a modification of the verses of the Provencal troubadours, but Renan says it's Celtic. Gaston Paris says it's Breton. Seyer says it comes from a mixture of Plato and pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. <laughs> Professor Nadler, who is a learned German critic, says that Romanticism is really the homesickness of those Germans who live between the Elbe and the Niemen, their homesickness for the old central Germany from which they once came, the daydreams of exiles and colonists. Eichendorf says it is Protestant nostalgia for the Catholic Church. But Chateaubriand, who didn't live between the Elbe and the Neiman and therefore didn't experience these emotions, says it is the secret and inexpressible delight of a soul playing with itself. I speak everlastingly of myself. <laughs> and Professor Aymon says it is the will to love, something, an attitude or an emotion towards others, not towards oneself, the very opposite of the will to power. Middleton Murray says Shakespeare was essentially a romantic writer and adds, all great writers since Rousseau have been romantic. But the eminent Marxist critic, Professor Georg Lukacs, says, 
No great writers are romantic. Least of all, Scott, Hugo, and Stendhal. <laughs> so that, in a sense, as you can see, there is some difficulty in, at any rate, if we take these quotations by about men who, after all, uh, have deserved to be, to be read. Or other, in other respects, profound and brilliant writers in many subjects, there is some difficulty in discovering what it is that is a common element in all these generalizations. That is why Professor Northrop Fry was so very wise to warn against it. Uh, and all these definitions, so far as I know, have never really been protested by anyone. They have never incurred that degree of critical wrath which might have come to anyone who had really produced definitions or generalizations which were universally regarded as absurd and, and, and irrelevant. Let me now go on to my, the task which I next set myself, which is to see what characteristics have on the whole been called romantic by writers on this subject, by critics. And a very peculiar result emerges. It is, let me read you what I've, I've read, I've, there are no fewer than ten categories which I've accumulated. I must ask you to bear with me while I read them out. But I think they do throw light upon the subject. At any rate, they indicate the extreme difficulty of the subject which I was so unwise to have chosen. <laughs> Romanticism is the primitive, the untutored. It is youth, life, an exuberant sense of life of the natural man. But it is also pallor, fever, disease, decadence, the maladie des siècles, la belle dame sans merci, the dance of death, indeed death itself. It is Shelley's dome of many colored glass, and it is also his white radiance of eternity. It is the confused, teeming fullness, fülle des Lebens, the confused, teeming fullness and richness of life, inexhaustible multiplicity, turbulence, violence, conflict, chaos, but also it is peace, oneness with the great I am, harmony with the natural order, music of the spheres, dissolution in the eternal, all-containing spirit. It is the strange, the exotic, the grotesque, the mysterious, the supernatural, ruins, moonlight, enchanted castles, hunting horns, elves, giants, griffins, falling water, the old mill on the floss, darkness and the powers of darkness, phantoms, vampires, nameless terror, the irrational, the unutterable. Also it is the familiar, the sense of one's unique tradition, joy in the smiling aspect of everyday nature and the accustomed sights and sounds of contented, simple, rural folk, the sane and happy wisdom of rosy-cheeked sons of the soil. It is the ancient, the historic, it is Gothic cathedrals, mists of antiquity, ancient roots, and the old order with its unanalyzable qualities, its profound but inexpressible loyalties, the impalpable, the imponderable. Also it is the pursuit of novelty, revolutionary change, concern with the fleeting present, desire to live in the moment, rejection of knowledge, past and future, the pastoral idyll of happy innocence, joy in the passing instant, a sense of timelessness. It is nostalgia, it is reverie, it is the intoxicating dreams, it is sweet melancholy and bitter melancholy, solitude, the sufferings of exile, the sense of alienation, roaming in remote places, especially the East, and roaming in remote times, especially the Middle Ages. But also it is happy cooperation in a common creative effort, the sense of forming part of a church, a class, a party, a tradition, a great and, 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 and all-containing symmetrical hierarchy, knights and retainers, the, rank, the ranks of the church, organic social ties, mystic unity, one faith, one land, one blood, la terre et les morts, as I think Barres said, the great society of the dead and the living and the yet unborn. It is the Toryism of Scott and Southey and Wordsworth, and it is the radicalism of Shelley, Büchner and Stendhal. It is Chateaubriand's aesthetic medievalism, and it is Michelet's loathing of the Middle Ages. It is Carlyle's worship of authority and Hugo's hatred of authority. It's extreme nature mysticism and extreme anti-naturalist aestheticism. It is energy, force, will, youth, life, etalage du moi. It's also self-torture, self-annihilation, suicide. It is the primitive, the unsophisticated, the bosom of nature, green fields, cowbells, murmuring brooks, the infinite blue sky. No less, however, it is also dandyism, the desire to dress up, red waistcoats, green wigs, blue hair, which the followers of people like Gérard de Nerval wore in Paris at a period. It's the lobster which Gérard de Nerval led about on a string in the streets of Paris. It's wild exhibitionism, eccentricity. It is the Battle of Hernani. It's ennui. It's tidium vitae. It is the death of Sardinapolis, whether painted by Delacroix or written about by Berlioz or Byron. 
It is a convulsion of great empires, wars, slaughter, and the crashing of worlds. The romantic hero is the rebel, the homme fatal, the damned soul, Corsairs, Manfreds, Jawas, Laras, Canes, all the population of Byron's heroic poems. It is Melmoth, it is Jean Bogart, all the outcasts and Ishmaels, as well as the golden-hearted courtesans and the noble-hearted convicts of 19th century fiction. It is drinking out of the human skull. It's Berlioz who said he wanted to climb Vesuvius in order to commune with the kindred soul. It's satanic revels, cynical irony, diabolical laughter, black heroes, but also Blake's vision of God and his angels, the great Christian society, the eternal order, and I quote, the starry heavens which can scarce express the infinite and eternal of the Christian soul. It is, in short, unity and multiplicity. It's fidelity to a particular in painting, the paintings of nature, for example, and also mysterious, tantalizing vagueness of outline. It's beauty and ugliness. It's art for art's sake, and art as an instrument of social salvation. It's strength and weakness, individualism and collectivism, purity and corruption, revolution and reaction, peace and war, love of life and love of death. It is perhaps not very surprising that faced with this, Professor Lovejoy, who is certainly the most scrupulous and one of the most illuminating scholars who ever dealt with the history of the ideas of the last two centuries, approached a condition nearing despair. He said that not only were all the strands of romantic thought which he was able to unravel, some of them contradict the others, which is patently true, some totally irrelevant to the others, but he took two specimens of what nobody would deny to be romanticism, for example, primitivism, and, he, and, and the other, eccentricity, dandyism, and asked what they had in common. Primitivism, which began in English verse, let us say, and partly English prose, at the beginning of the 18th century, celebrates the noble savage, the simple life, the irregular patterns of spontaneous action as against the corrupt sophistication and Alexandrine verse of a highly sophisticated society. It's an attempt to demonstrate that there is natural law which can be discovered best in the untutored heart of the uncorrupted native or the uncorrupted child. Answers Professor Lovejoy quite intelligibly, what has this in common with red waistcoats, blue hair, green wigs, absent, death, suicide, and the general eccentricity of the followers of Nerval and Gautier? And he concludes by saying that he really doesn't see what there is in common to these, and one, one, and one can sympathize with it. Well, you might say perhaps, you might perhaps say that there is an air of revolt in both. Both have revolted against some kind of civilization. Some in order to go to some Robinson Crusoe island, there to um, commune with nature and live among uncorrupted simple people, and the other in some kind of violent aestheticism and dandyism. But mere revolt cannot be romantic. Mere denunciation of corruption cannot be romantic. We don't regard the Hebrew prophets as particularly romantic. We don't regard Savonarola as particularly romantic. We don't even regard Methodist preachers as particularly romantic. And therefore, this, I think, is too wide of a mark. One therefore has a certain sympathy with Professor Lovejoy's despair in this matter. Let me read to you a, a passage which his disciple, Professor Boaz, also of Johns Hopkins University, wrote apropos of this. After the discrim discrimination of romanticisms made by Lovejoy, there ought to be no further discussion of what romanticism really was. There happens to be a variety of aesthetic doctrines, some of which were logically related to others, and some of which were not, all called by the same name. But this fact does not imply that they all had a common essence, any more than the fact that hundreds of people are called John Smith means that they are all of the same parentage. This is perhaps the most common and misleading error arising from the confusion of ideas and words. One could speak for hours about it alone, and perhaps one should. Uh, I, wish, I should like to relieve your feelings immediately by saying that I don't propose to do this. But, at the same time, I think that both Professor Lovejoy and Professor Boaz are eminent scholars they are, and great that their contribution has been towards illumination of thought, are on this instance mistaken. There was a romantic movement. It did have something which was central to it. It did create a great revolution in consciousness. And it is important to discover what this is. One can, of course, give up the whole game. One can say, like Valéry, words like romanticism and classicism, words like humanism and naturalism are not words are not names with which one can operate at all. Uh, one cannot get drunk, one cannot quench one's thirst with labels on bottles. And finally, there is much to be said to this point of view. At the same time, I think unless we do use some generalizations, it is impossible to trace the course of human history. And therefore, difficult as it may be, it is important to 
find out what it was that caused this enormous revolution in human consciousness, which appears to me to have occurred in those centuries. There are people who I think faced with this plethora of evidence which I've attempted to collect may feel some sympathy for the late Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch, who said with typical British breeziness, the whole pother about the difference of classical and romantic amounts to nothing that need trouble a healthy man. <laughs> I can't deny, I can't deny that I don't share this point of view. It appears to me, it appears to me to be excessively defeatist. And therefore, in the course of these lectures, I attempt, I shall, I shall make, do my best to try and explain what, in my view, the romantic movement fundamentally came to. I think the only sane and the only sensible way of approaching it, at least the only way that I've ever found to be helpful at all, is by slow and patient historical method. By looking at the beginning of the 18th century and considering what the situation was then, and then considering what the factors were which undermined it one by one, and what the particular combination or confluence of factors was, which by 1760, by 1770, and by 1780, caused what appears to me to be the greatest transformation of the Western consciousness, certainly in our time. Thank you very much indeed.